Welcome to part one in our series of carbohydrate lectures. In this section, you will learn about monosaccharide structure, the building blocks of larger carbohydrate polymers. First, let's review why learning about carbohydrates is important. Carbohydrates are used by biological systems as fuels and energy resources. Carbohydrates typically provide quick energy and are one of the primary energy storage forms in animals. Carbohydrates provide the precursors to other major macromolecules within the body, including the deoxyribose and ribose required for nucleic acid biosynthesis. Carbohydrates can also provide structural support and cushioning shock absorption, as well as cell-to-cell -cell communication, identification, and signaling. Carbohydrates, as their name implies, are water hydrates of carbon, and they all have the same basic core formula of CH2O to the N. And they're always found in the ratio of one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen, making them easy to identify from their molecular formula. Carbohydrates can be divided into subcategories based on their complexity. The simplest carbohydrates are the monosaccharides, which are the simple sugars required for the biosynthesis of all other carbohydrate types. Disaccharides consist of two monosaccharides that have been joined together by a covalent bond called the glycosidic bond. Oligosaccharides are polymers that consist of a few monosaccharides covalently linked together, and polysaccharides are large polymers that contain hundreds to thousands of monosaccharide units all joined together by glycosidic bonds. The remainder of this lecture will focus on monosaccharides. Monosaccharides all have alcohol functional groups associated with them. In addition, they also have one additional functional group, either an aldehyde or a ketone. Monosaccharides containing an aldehyde are called aldoses, while monosaccharides containing ketones are called ketoses. Monosaccharides are also named for the number of carbons that they contain. Three carbon sugars are trioses, four carbons are tetroses, five are pentoses, six are hexoses, and so on. Fischer projections are a useful way to represent the three-dimensional structure of sugars in only two dimensions. The diagram on the right shows the three-dimensional view of D-ribose, an aldopentose containing five carbons and an aldehyde functional group. On the left-hand side is the Fischer projection. This is a simplified drawing of the 3D model. In the Fischer projection, it is always noted that the horizontal bonds are in the orientation where they are coming out of the plane of the paper towards the viewer and that this projection represents the three-dimensional view that's shown on the right. Also note that the carbon numbering scheme matches that of the IUPAC system that you learned in organic chemistry. The number one carbon is located nearest the highest priority functional group. For a sugar monomer, this will be the end with the aldehyde or the ketone. Thus, D-ribose carbons are numbered one, two, three, four, and five, and have the molecular formula C5H10O5. So how do you convert the Fischer projection back into a line angle drawing that you are used to doing in organic chemistry? First, you need to think about the perspective that you are looking at the sugar functional groups. In the Fischer projection and the subsequent 3D ribbon view, you are looking at the sugar from the front vantage point, as our little penguin friend shown on the slide. See how his back is facing us and he is looking at the sugar molecule. In the line angle form, you are laying the sugar down on its side, like the little OH legs are sticking up into the air. Now your vantage point for looking at the molecule has shifted and the B represents the same orientation that our little penguin friend has in the upper diagram. See how all the OH and H bonds are folded up towards the B? To finish the conversion to the line angle, all you need to do now is rotate the bonds 
so that the correct bond angles are shown. For ribose, imagine rotating the 2 carbon to shift it into the down position, as shown in this bottom diagram. When you rotate it, the H comes out towards you from the plane of the paper, while the OH goes backwards from the plane of the paper. The same thing occurs when you shift the 4 carbon into the down position. The H comes out towards you from the plane of the paper, and the OH goes back away from you. This is the correct stereochemistry for the D-ribose written in the line angle form. You could also imagine flipping this whole thing over in space as shown in the top diagram. Both of these line angle drawings represent D-ribose. Drawing the line angle presentations of sugars from the Fisher projections takes a little practice, but stereochemistry is very important in sugar chemistry. Hopefully now you can recognize aldoses from ketoses and name them according to how many carbons they contain. The aldopentose on the left with an aldehyde functional group and five carbons, and the ketohexose on the right with the ketone functional group and six carbons. Recall that aldehydes and ketones have different oxidative potential. Aldehydes can be further oxidized to the carboxylic acid, whereas ketones cannot. The ketone is already fully oxidized. These reactions are the same for the aldehydes and ketones found in sugar monomers. Sugars with aldehydes can act as reducing sugars. That means as they are oxidized, they reduce another molecule or act as a reducing agent. Recall that oxidation reactions lose electrons while reduction reactions gain electrons. Because electrons do not just disappear, these reactions are coupled together. You cannot have oxidation without reduction or vice versa. The conclusion, aldoses can act as reducing agents, whereas ketoses cannot. This feature has been useful in the detection of aldoses in the urine. Normally, urine does not contain detectable quantities of glucose or other sugar monomers. However, in the disease states such as diabetes, glucose is excreted by the kidneys into the urine. The Benedict's test for aldose sugars can be used clinically to test for aldoses in urine. Note that this reaction reduces the copper from the 2 plus state to the 1 plus state, changing the color of the copper from blue to brick red. Partial reduction of the copper is seen as green to orange variations. Due to the high number of chiral centers within the sugar structures, they generate a lot of potential isomers. For every aldo structure, there exists a ketose with the same molecular formula. These are known as constitutional or structural isomers. That means they have the same molecular formula, but a different bonded order of the atoms. Sugars can also form many stereoisomers. That means sugars have the same molecular formula and the same bonded order but a different three-dimensional arrangement in space. To determine how many stereoisomers exist for a particular sugar, you need to first determine how many chiral centers the sugar has. It's best to evaluate every possible carbon for chirality and then count up how many are chiral. If we start with the carbon one, we can look at the sugar groups that are attached to it. There are only three different groups. Since oxygen is double bonded to the carbon, the carbon is found to be achiral and does not generate a stereocenter. Moving down, let's examine carbon two. This time, we see that carbon two has four different groups bonded to it.
the H, the OH, the two larger groups. Thus carbon 2 is chiral and does generate a stereocenter. Following the examination of the remaining carbons, you can see that there are a total of four carbon centers in glucose. To determine the number of stereoisomers, use the formula 2 to the n, where n equals the number of chiral carbons in the molecule. For glucose, this would be four chiral centers for a total of 16 stereoisomers. Note that this only refers to stereoisomers and not to constitutional isomers. To look at all the stereoisomers, we will simplify the Fischer projections further to Rosenhoff projections. In Rosenhoff projections, only the direction of the hydroxyl group is given by the horizontal bonds. The hydrogens bonded are implied. So for glucose, you can see that the OH is on the right, the left, the right, and the right. The position of the hydroxyl groups to the right or to the left designates the stereochemistry of the sugar. Here are the 16 stereoisomers of glucose, or more broadly, aldohexoses. Stereoisomers can be classified further as either diastereomers or enantiomers. Enantiomers are a special type of stereoisomer that are also optical isomers. This means that they are the mirror image of the molecule, but that they are not superimposable. Diastereomers differ at one or more stereocenters, but they are not optical isomers. That means they are not mirror images. Interestingly, you may notice that the enantiomer pairs are given the same name. They only differ in the D or L designation. This is because enantiomer pairs have the same chemical and physical properties, except for the way that they rotate plain polarized light. They either rotate it in the dextrorotary, right-handed, or D, or levorotary, left-handed, or L directions. Thus, enantiomer pairs are very difficult to separate from one another, and are given the same name. However, their biological activities are often dramatically different as enzymes require the correct structure to bind with the molecule. The wrong stereoisomer will not bind an enzyme of interest. Each sugar has a mirror image or an enantiomer. In summary, enantiomer pairs have the same molecular formula, are mirror images of one another, and have the same chemical or physical properties, except for the rotation of plain polarized light and their ability to interact with biological molecules. Thus, they are given the same name with the D or L designation. How are the DNL conformations determined? To determine the D or L designation, Look at the chiral center the farthest away from the major functional group, the aldehyde or the ketone. For glucose, this is carbon 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If the OH is on the right side, it is the D conformation. If the OH is on the left side, it is the L conformation. Most of the sugars found in nature are in the D conformation. How about the diastereomers? These are the stereoisomers that differ in one or more chiral centers but are not mirror images. All of the other pairings on the slides are classified as diastereomers. Note that diastereomer pairs all have the same formula but they do have different physical and chemical characteristics and thus have different names. Some diastereomers differ only at one position, while others differ at multiple positions. The pairs that differ at only one chiral center are given a special name. They are called epimers. 
enzymes in the class of isomerases that alter a compound into its epimer are called epimerases. Come back to this slide and try to find all the epimer pairs of D allose. You should find four since there are four chiral centers. Here is a slide of some common aldoses in nature. You will need to be able to sight recognize the ones that are highlighted in yellow. These ones play a significant role in cellular metabolism or signaling pathways. They are D-glyceraldehyde, D-ribose, D-glucose, D-mannose, and D-galactose. You only need to know two important ketoses, dihydroxyacetone and D-fructose. In this section, you learned about important characteristics of monosaccharides. These include the concepts of aldoses versus ketoses, class naming, finding the number of isomers a sugar should have, and determining the type of isomers present. You also learned how to alter a sugar's appearance from the Fisher projection to the line angle drawing, although I won't ask you to perform this skill on a term exam.